statistics as soon as I get these opening statements. Uh, these same teachers seem to be reflected in 1 Peter 6, 3 through 5, and you might want to look at that quickly. Uh, Peter pulls from the common sources of his day, the things that the man on the street would have known. Peter uses as examples. Now, he's going to use the Old Testament a lot. He's going to use the book of 1 Peter, I mean, excuse me, the book of First Enoch a lot. If you've never read this little book, this is an interesting book. This is a wild little book, and I think that a lot of the allusions from this chapter come from this book. It was known in Peter's day. Um, the guy who translated this, R.H. Charles, says that First Enoch has had more influence on the New Testament than any other non-canonical book. He's also going to draw from pagan sources. And... Um, there seems to be an allusion from another extra-canonical book called The Assumption of Moses in here. Uh, the Bible is very ambiguous, I believe on purpose, as to the origin, the fall, and the activities of the angelic world. You ever thought about it? It does not tell us everything. It tells us an unseen world, co-present with ours, influencing ours, impenetrating ours, but does not tell us a lot about where they came from, what their purpose is, and on and on. And so... Uh, this book is going to uh, make allusions to this popular practice of a highly developed angelology. Now, I think you'll see very quickly that this is going to get really wild. And um, angelology developed in the interbiblical period. These Gnostics took it far beyond bounds in their system of eons between the holy God and the God that made matter. And we'll, we'll get into that. Um, verses 4 through 9 are one sentence in Greek that give three examples from the Old Testament. This is that wild section I'm te telling you about. And then later on in verses 15 and 16 is another example from the Old Testament, Balaam. Um, okay, let me quickly go over with you the characteristics of the antinomian false teachers. And I wish you'd go through your text and write a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, I think it's seven of them. Uh, and then we'll come back and do them individually. The first one is uh, found here in verse 1 where it says, they deny the master. Do you see that? In verse 2, immoral ways. In verse 3, in their greed. In verse 3, messages manufactured by themselves. Drop all the way down to verse 10, who despise authority. In verse 12, they're like irrational animals, mere creatures of instinct. Verse 13, their daily luxurious living down in 13 again. Their religious feasting with you. And 14, they practice enticing unsteady souls. And in 19, they promise freedom, but they are slaves to destruction themselves. Now, those are the characteristics of these false teachers that we'll get into one at a time as we go through here. Okay, let's begin 2 Peter 2, verse 1. Now, there are false prophets among the people. Now, this goes back to chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, that talks about true prophets. There are true prophets, but if you've read the Old Testament, there are obviously false prophets. Now, we're talking about the Jewish people here. Just as there will be false teachers among you too, there's the Gentile Christians, okay, uh, who will insidiously introduce destructive heresies. Now, this term, insidiously introduce, the Greek means to sneak in alongside of. Now, heresy always comes from inside the church. Heresy is always a mixture of truth and error. Usually, it is the, the lifting up of one doctrine to the exclusion of other doctrines, or it's a per slight perversion of a true doctrine. Now, I think we see that all around us. These men are trying to sneak in these Slightly different attitudes. They've changed the melody just slightly and trying to sneak it in to the community. Now, you may have in your translation the word and, but I think the word even should be there. Even deny the master. Now, one or two things are possible. These are Gnostics, which means they would, uh, they would affirm the spirituality of Jesus, but would have, would have great reservation about his humanity. So they would deny something of the fullness of Jesus as far as human and divine. 
Or maybe they deny the master by the way that they live because they're going to be grossly immoral people. And so either it's a theological denial or a practical denial. And which it is, I'm not real certain. The master who has bought them. Now we're going to get into a real hair pool, and I mean that, over are these false teachers Christians or not? Were they ever Christians or not? Did they fall from a state of being Christians? Or, or were they never Christians? Well, here some say, it says the master who bought them, that must mean they're Christians. But I, there, I really have problems with that because there are many passages in the Bible that say that Jesus died for all men. Let me give you a couple if I could. Um, Hebrews 2.19, 1 Timothy 2.6, 1 John 2.2. 2. So I think he died for all men, and I'm not sure we can use this. Now the word bought is eris tense, once and for all, and it's from an Old Testament background that meant to purchase back a slave or purchase back a prisoner of war. And the background is the near kinsman. We call him the Goel. The book of Ruth, Boaz, was a near kinsman to Ruth. And that's the, that's the background of this. Now, uh, thus bring on themselves swift destruction. Now this is temporal judgment. Have you ever heard of the English word apollyon? It means destruction. That's, that comes from this word right here. Many people will follow their immoral ways. Now, these are people claim to be Christians, uh, but are using their Christianity as a license. Now, you might want to see verses 10, 14, and 18 that show some of these immoral ways. And because of them, the true way will be abused. Now, the word the true way, my little word way, is capitalized in my Bible. Is it yours? This was the early title for the church. Before the, the church was called Christians, it was called the way. Let me give you a few references. Acts 9-2, Acts 18, 25 and 26, Acts 19, 9 and 23, Acts 22, 4, Acts 24, 14 and 22, the way. It goes back to the Old Testament that the life of faith is a life within God-given bounds. It is a life down the well-worn path of God's revelation. And that's what the way, the well-worn path of revealed truth, the Christian life is a lifestyle. Now it says we'll be abused. Remember the early Christians were accused of several things. They were accused of incest. They were accused of cannibalism. They were accused of, of immorality. They were accused of treason. They were accused of atheism. Now the lives of these false teachers are adding to that misunderstanding. They are, they are living very immoral pagan lives but claiming to be Christian and therefore adding to these charges of immorality and misunderstanding that the early church had to deal with. Now in verse 3 it says, in their greed. Now, there are several of the passages. Paul was very nervous about ever taking money for his teaching because many Greek philosophical people would travel around and teach for money. And Paul was always nervous about that. Let me give you a few references. Micah chapter 3 verse 11 is an Old Testament reference. And then 1 Peter 6, 5 and Titus 1, 11 talks about people who teach just for money. And these people were doing that. They will exploit you. Now, King James has make merchandise of you. This is a commercial term. We get the English term emporium from this term right here, okay? With messages manufactured by themselves. Now, this is the message, I think, about these eons. There's a holy God who is Holy Spirit and cannot touch matter because matter and spirit are antithetical in Gnostic systems. So between the holy God and the God who made the world, Yahweh, there was a lot of series of lesser gods until we got far enough away from the holy God for some God to touch matter. Jesus is one of these eons, maybe the highest or somewhere in the series. Now the word manufactured, we get the English term plastic from this Greek word, from the word manufactured here. From old, their condemnation has not been idle, and their destruction has not been slumbering. Now follows verses 4 through 9, which is one sentence in Greek. 4 through 9 is one sentence. With three Old Testament examples. Let me show you quickly. In verse 4, the angels that sinned, and down in verse 5, the flood, and then in verse 6, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now the wildest thing I'm going to say tonight, probably because you haven't heard it before, is my understanding of verse 4. Now, if there is a first-class conditional, assume true. For since God did not spare the angels who sinned, but hurled them down to Tartarus and committed them to the darkest dungeons to await their doom. Now, the book of 1st Enoch, and I, this is going to be different for you, so hang with me, okay? Most of my life, I have heard 
the flood interpreted as wicked people whose heart was on evil always and God just got sick of them and wiped out the whole human race except Noah and his sons and their families. But the book of 1st Enoch has a different interpretation. If you'll turn quickly to Genesis chapter 6, about verses 1, 2, 3, 4, right through there, you'll see that it says, The sons of God married the daughters of men, and the Nephilim were born to them. Now that same thing is referred to in Jude chapter 6. Angels that kept not their proper state were condemned to Tartarus. The book of 1st Enoch says that angels married or seduced human women and the sexual offspring of that was the giants that we know as the Nephilim or the Raphidim. Now you say that sounds really wild. You know, I think there's probably a root of truth in most ancient mythology. Think about the mythology of the Roman and Greek pantheons. The gods of Mount Olympus interact with human beings sexually and every other way. And the titans or the giants came from those relationships. Now, first Enoch is going to say the reason for the flood is that the angels brought knowledge to men that men shouldn't have. Magic, sorcery, demonology, that kind of stuff. And so what God did in the flood was destroy the race of half men and half angels. And the purpose of the flood was destruction of a mixed race, not simply of sinful people. Now every place in the Old Testament, almost without exception, there is a couple of exceptions, but every place in the Old Testament, the term the sons of God is mentioned in the plural, it always refers to the angels. Now some interpreters say it refers to the sons of Seth uh, marrying the, the, you know, the, the daughters of Cain or something like that. Well, I think with all the evidence being in, I prefer the, the opinion that angels married women or took women. Now these angels that did that are not the demons because these angels that did that are locked up in a place called Tartarus. Now this is the only place in the Bible the word Tartarus is used except in Jude. And Tartarus is the Greek place, the lowest hell, where the titans are kept. Now who are the titans? They are the giants that came from the mixing of humans and angels in the Olympian Greek pantheon. This is the only place this whole idea. So those angels that did that are not loose. They are reserved for judgment. And they're in a place called Tartarus. There are three places. I've done a tape on Sheol, Hades, Gehenna, and Tartarus, which is all the places in the Bible where people and angels go when they die. And if you want that tape, I'll, we'll make that available to you. Okay? Now, so let's, let's continue then. The word dark dungeons... King James has chains. It's a very similar word coming from Jude 6. But this means large underground granaries. Okay? To await their doom. Present, passive, participle. Reserved for judgment. These angels are not loose. And then in verse 5 it talks about Noah, preacher of righteousness, uh, and seven others. That's his three sons and their wives and his wife. The flood came upon the world of godless people. And if he... Uh, condemned by burning them to ashes, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's Genesis 19, 24. Do you notice that all these accounts involve angels? All of them. So does Balaam a little, while, a little later in the chapter. Um, it talks about Noah in verses 7. Notice it says, Lot, who was constantly distressed by the immoral conduct of lawless men. Friends, you read the Old Testament, Lot was perfectly at home in Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, th this author made Lot a lot better fellow than he was, I think. <laughs> um, okay. Surely then, verse 9, when the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from trial and keep wrongdoers under punishment for the day of judgment. The earlier was temporal judgment. This is eschatological judgment. Especially those who satisfy their lower nature by indulging in the evil passions which defile them. Now this, of course, is a reference to these immoral antinomian Gnostics. I want to say a word about morality and sin for a minute. And, and I hope you hear this because I think it's true. God has made our bodies to enjoy our world. Would you buy that? Eyes to see its beauty, touch to feel, 
uh, he's made us sexually to enjoy that, and there's nothing, nothing wrong. That is a gift from God, as all of our human senses are. But what men do is take God-given things and take them beyond God-given bounds. All of God's gift are channeled for the goodness of individuals and the goodness of society. When we go beyond the limits that God places on the gifts, the gifts become evil. Do you see what's happening? Men have taken every gift from God and twisted it into something evil. And that's what these men have done. There's nothing wrong with what they're doing as long as in God-given channels. But it's gone beyond God-given channels, and that's the problem. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, who despise authority. Now, the word authority here is the word kurios or Lord. Now, this is one of the ranks of angels, despise authority, mentioned in Colossians 1.16. Now, I really think we're talking about angels here. Um, a little later, it's going to talk about glory, which is another rank of angels. And so, yeah, then in the word majesty in the last of verse 10, that's the word glory, which is also used of angelic ranks. And there are many of these listings. The last few uh, verses of Romans 8 list these. Uh, Ephesians 6 is called principalities, powers, and authorities. These are, I think, ranks of these angels. Uh, daring, headstrong men who do not tremble when they abuse persons of majesty. Now, some say that is civil leaders. Some say that is church leaders. But because of the context, I think we're talking about angels. These men were trying to manipulate the spiritual forces for their own benefit. Now, what do we call it today? Magic. Sorcery, right? Isn't that what we're talking about? That is, we're trying to manipulate the spiritual powers through magical words or names to do our bidding. That's what these guys are trying to do with angels. Uh, Whereas angels who are far superior in strength and power than these beings bring no abusive accusation against them before the Lord. Now, this refers to Jude 8 and 9, where Michael, in fighting... This is going to sound really weird to you, but you can look it up. Michael was fighting with Satan over the body of Moses. Remember, Moses was died on Mount Nebo, but nobody buried him. They don't know where his grave is. Well, in a little book called The Assumption of Moses, Satan and Michael, the archangel, the, nation of, the angel of the nation of Israel from the book of Daniel, are fighting over Moses' body. And Michael refuses to bring a railing accusation against Satan, but lets the Lord do it. And that's the illusion here. If you'll read... Uh, Jude 8 and 9, you'll see that full allusion there. Verse 12, these re- men are like irrational animals, mere creatures of instinct. I'll tell you what, some of, the, some of the movies I see advertised today, some of the books I see as I walk through the grocery store are nothing more than human beings on an animal level. Letting any instinct, any passion, any desire run rampant without mental control is what we're talking about, whatever it might be. Created to be taught and killed. They, they blaspheme the things they do not understand, and so by their corruption they'll be destroyed, suffering wrong as a punishment for their wrongdoing. They think uh, their daily luxurious living real pleasure. Now, King, New American Standard has their living, their, their uh, sinning in the daytime. Now, what these, I think what the illusion here is, these people have become so flagrant that they're doing in the light what most people do in the dark. Um, they're not trying to cover up their actions anymore. They're willing for everybody to know what they do, and they're doing it in the light. They are spots and blots, deceitfully living in luxurious pleasure while they continue their religious feasting with you. Now, if you look at Jude 12, it mentions love feast. These people were going to the Lord's Supper. But they were going to the Lord's Supper for another purpose than worship. They were going for the purpose of seduction. And everybody they saw was a sex object. And we're talking about the the church meeting Lord's Supper. They have have snuck into the love feast. Look at Jude 12. Um, Their eyes are full of adultery. Literally it means... Uh, eyes of an adulteress, and insatiable by sin, they entice, practice enticing unsteady souls, that means new believers, I think, 
They have trained their hearts in greed. This is the word trained is a perfect passive, which means they've trained it in the past. They remain that way. It's the word English word gymnasium. They've trained their hearts in greed, and they are doomed to a curse. These people are in the Christian fellowship. They are there for the sole purpose of satisfying their own bodily pleasures, their, whether it be money or sex or whatever they want, and they're exploiting the new converts who are not steady in the faith. These people are coming straight out of paganism where these immoral practices were done in the name of the gods, be it Bacchus or Osiris or Astarte. And so these false teachers say, now you're a Christian, good. You know the Lord Jesus, good. But now we want to show you that you can have as much fun here as you had there. And you can see the kind of destructive destructive thing this was doing to the fellowship of the early church. They have left the straight road and gone astray. And the term straight road is another Old Testament idea. In the Old Testament, the words straight, right, and just are all come from a word that means a measuring reed, or we would call it a, a measuring stick. God is the standard. Any deviation from the standard is sin. So the Hebrew words for sin mean crooked or perverse or falling short of the mark. Now, when it says the straight road, they've left the standard of God. And you see where it says they have gone astray? That's the English word planet, which when people watch the stars, some things, some stars didn't work right. They went clear across in opposite directions. That's the planets. That's where the word came from, going astray. Have followed the road of Balaam. Now, remember Balaam. He's the guy in Numbers 22 that, whose donkey was more spiritual than him. <laughs> the donkey saw the angel and the Lord standing in the way with the sword and... And Balaam kept kicking that donkey, saying, go on. And finally, the donkey threw him off. He looked up, and there was the angel. Remember the angel spoke through the donkey? Friends, I've always thought if, a, if God can use a donkey, he can use us. But um, <laughs> you might want to read that. He was greedy. He was going to curse the children of Israel for money. And God wouldn't let him, so he said, send your women down into the camp. Moab and Israel became connected with the Baal of Peor, the, the sexual fertility worship in Numbers 22 who fell in love with the prophets of wrongdoing but was reproved for his offense, and a dumb animal spoke with a human voice and stopped the prophet's madness. That's Numbers 22. Okay, now 17 and following is another paragraph. These people, such men are dried up springs, clouds driven by the storm. Now, if you're in a desert community, even in Lubbock, when those, when those uh, you need rain so bad and those black clouds blow in the morning, you think, it's going to rain today. Come 10 o'clock, those clouds are gone. They had no moisture. They just looked like it, right? These men have the promise of wisdom, intelligence, you know, spirituality, but it's a lie. It's a facade. That's what this is saying. With full knowledge of the Lord Jesus, uh, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and again become entangled in them. Now, they know completely the Christian truth. This is the word epigenosko, full knowledge. They understand completely the gospel message. They have light, okay? And they again become entangled in them. What? These corrupting ways. And are conquered by them. Their last condition is worse than their former one. It would have been better for them if they had never known the way of righteousness than to have known it and turned their backs on the sacred commandments to their trust. In them is verified the truth of the proverb, a dog turns back to what it ha he has vomited. And the other proverb, a sow that has washed herself goes back to wallow in the mire. Now my question to you is, is this referring to the false teachers or to the new believers they corrupted? Contextually, it seems to me it's referring to the false teachers themselves. Now here's the question. Were they ever Christians and fell from being Christians. It says they've known the full knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but they've become entangled again in the world, these pagan corrupted systems. Their last condition is worse than their former one. It is better they had never known than to turn their backs. Friends, we're in, we're in a tough area. Would you agree? Now, I've got several theories. Number one, number one is it doesn't refer to salvation, but refers to their influence on others. You buy that? Some would say that here. I think we can probably say that because we're nervous about people falling from grace. And so we try every way in the world to wiggle out of it. <laughs> Number two, this is similar to the unpardonable sin. This is similar to Hebrews 6 and 10. In the presence of great light, 
These Jews who almost came to accept Jesus understood completely the gospel but refused and went back to the synagogue. Now, the unpardonable sins, much like the Pharisees, seeing the miracles of Jesus, hearing the great truths, said to themselves, he's of the devil, not of God. Now, that may be this is the unpardonable sin. In the presence of great light, they turn away. Friends, it's better to have never known God than to, in the presence of great light, turn away. That may be what it means. This may refer to the parable of the soils, Matthew 13. These, these people may have, may have sprouted, received the message, but when persecution or problems came, they fell away. It is not germination, but fruit-bearing that is the essence of salvation in Matthew 13. Maybe that's what's referred to. I really don't know, but, but um, notice it says, it would have been better if they had never known the way of righteousness than to have known it and turned their backs. I've got to believe that these are not apostatizing Christians, but these are unbelievers that came so close they, they understood the gospel. They understood the preaching. They, they understood the place of Jesus Christ. But instead of receiving that and yielding themselves to it, they took what they wanted from that, added to it themselves, and made a synthesis that is not the real thing. It would have been better if they would have never known than perverting the truth for themselves and influencing others is what I really think it's referring to. And the Proverbs about the dog and the hog as you know, they were very hated animals by the Jews. And this must have been a common proverb. You might want to see Proverbs 26, 11, where this is mentioned. Now, this is a wild chapter. Would you buy that? This would be like me preaching a sermon and using contemporary examples from modern movies. Like, what if I wanted to preach on God and use the Star Wars, the Force will always be with you. Now, you understand immediately what I was talking about because that's just a popular movie in our culture, right? I'm not giving that movie divine authority by using it as an example. I'm just quoting something that everybody in my culture would understand. That's what Peter's doing. He's not giving first in it divine authority. He's just saying, you all know this, and he uses this as an example. The illustrations here are what cause people so much problems because it deals with this area that we're all curious of, but we're not certain of, and that is... How do the angels, where do they come from? What are they doing? How do they interrelate to us? How can we control them? Friends, don't let your curiosity go beyond what God has revealed to us in his book. The angels are not a source for us to go to, to pray to. They are an influence in our life. I think all believers have guardian angels. I believe angels were involved in Jesus' life. But it's not a subject that God chose to reveal to us. Therefore, we affirm its truth, but we do not get involved in the intricacies or theories that these folks did involving the angels.